Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Those of you who have come in person to CDOB, in this second year of the summer course, Sofia Corradi about the future of the European Union and the challenges faced and the future of the EU. A lot of people are following us right now online, and therefore they are connected to the course virtually. And as you know, the, the course will be in three languages, Castilian, Spanish, Catalan, and English. So anybody needing interpretation, you have three channels in YouTube, English, Catalan, and Spanish, to follow the different sessions of this course. So on our side, the three institutions, the three organizing institutions for this course are very, very happy for the first year, which was wonderful, and also how the second year's course has been welcomed. We have more than 600 people registered, those who are in person and those who follow us online from different places in Europe, basically, and beyond. And therefore, this shows the interest this course generates and also the need that exists that European institution headquartered in Barcelona and also a think tank like CIDOP take advantage of this constant information demand, this constant interest about the EU. As you know, we will be having three days three theme days devoted to the main issues of the European agenda, economic governance, technological governance, and the geopolitical issue in Europe. Each one of them will be dealt with in each session, but always with a shared vehicle, i.e. expert outlooks, Particip participating experts from the think tank, from external think tanks and our own, and the institutional gaze, those who are in charge of the public responsibility, the political responsibility, either at the Parliament or the European Commission. And therefore, they bring forth to make Europe and not only to think Europe, which think tanks like CDOB actually do. So this combination between expert and institutional perspectives will allow us to have a wide-ranging and holistic vision about the state of the EU, the state of the EU with its main challenges. Today we will start with the economic governance of the EU. We will have a hybrid session with Claudia Perez, who is the deputy director of the El País newspaper, who is here in person, and Ernest Urtazun, who is a European member of parliament, who will be connected from Brussels. And then a panel discussion that Claudia will actually be moderating. And this will be this this model will be replicated in the following sessions tomorrow and on Friday for the other theme. So on my side, welcome to CDOP. It's such a pleasure to welcome you here and to share the ad this adventure with Sergi Manuel and their teams for the organization of this course, which is quite demanding I have to say, because it implies some organizational challenges that we had to overcome complex organizational issues with the hybrid nature of the different interventions and I'm sure it's going to be very fruitful as last year's course was. So now I'm going to give the floor to Sergi and then to Jose Manuel and then we will start with the video that will actually launch the course in itself. Good afternoon and thank you very much Paul. I'd like to thank the CDOP team and our EU Commission's colleagues and to make possible this second year of the course about the EU. Now, this year of the course is called the Sofia Corredi EU course uh, that actually has the name of the creator of the most popular and successful um, program in the EU, the, the Erasmus program. We called her daughter 
and she told us that unfortunately due to her fragile health, Mrs. Corradi will not be able to be here with us today. But she has sent a video that we will all be able to hear and listen to. And so let me share with you the origins of the Erasmus program, because they're not well known. And they have a very personal relationship with her, with Mrs. Corradi. When she studied law at the Sapienza University, Sofia Corradi got a Fulbright scholarship to go to the 1957-1958 course to Colombia in New York. And when she came back to Italy the following year, she asked what anybody would do nowadays, i.e. to actually validate some of the subject matters of her studies in New York. And uh, her tutor said, well, that's not possible, Sophia, they said. So what she had to do is to study again what she had already approved during the year she spent in New York. And that's when she started, Sophia Corradi started to create a program for the exchange of students within the EU. That implies a full recognition of the studies carried out in another country. If you think that was easy, well, it was not easy. She took almost 20 years to achieve that. At any rate, nowadays, everybody knows about the Erasmus program that has had more than 10 million students. More than 10 million students have been able to study abroad. And with the summer course, we contribute to the recognition of Sofia Corradi, also known as Mama Erasmus. And with regards to the three sessions, the three topics that will be dealt with, first thing I'd like to say that the EU learned or took its, more ambitious, its most ambitious decision in the past decades in 2020 when it created the next generation EU recovery fund with 750 billion euro for 2021-2023. And out of all of that money, the recovery and resilience mechanism is its hard core with 672 billion euro. Money that's divided up equally into two parts, loans and subsidies. As a co-legislator, the European Parliament decided how this money can be spent. And it also exercises its control, uh, its control power by supervising it. At the end of June, the full assembly of the European Parliament approved a report in which th three things were asked. Transparency in the recovery aid, to condition it to the state of law and to guarantee the maximum profitability of that, the, that investment. And this was done because of the next evaluation of the recovery mechanism that the EU foresees on the 31st of July. And it is for this reason that today's session we have wanted to invite as a keynote speaker one of the Euro MPs who has been uh, a rapporteur of the Greens who is a member of the work group of the European Parliament about the scrutiny of the resilience mechanism, Mr. Ernest Hurtado, Hurtasun. Tomorrow, about innovation and technology, let me remind you, as an example of that, a few weeks before the start of the Russian attack against Ukraine on the 8th of February, there was a proposal of a draft of an EU law of chips to face the lack of chips and to reinforce European uh, technological leadership. And to illustrate it, we, let me share with you a few data. In 2020, for the world, one billion microchips were manufactured, and and the EU quote market share is just a one percent. And with Clement a group, it's just a ten percent. This is part of our research list, and I thank him for having come to Barcelona for this. And finally, on Friday, we have as a keynote speaker the chairman of the. External Affairs Committee, the German Euro MP, Mike Allenston. He also received the delegation of the EU delegation that visited Ukraine from the 31st of January to, till the 1st of February before the start of the Russian attack against Ukraine. The consequences of a war that has lasted for almost five months are well known. The main one is the humanitarian crisis. One of the people who have died, who are injured, or more than 6 million refugees or displaced people, according to Agnew. 3.6 million of these refugees have been able to come to EU because of the temporary protection that was approved in 2001 and that for the first time is being applied and is being used. The future reconstruction of the country that Kiev has actually said as of today it is 750 
billion dollars. The future of the external policy, the reinforcement of the relationship between the EU and NATO, or the energy crisis. In fact, this is the stress test, the most immediate stress test that the EU has to face to guarantee for the winter the supply of uh, affordable energy sources and to guarantee measures for a close relationship between the 27 member states with regards to the energy. On the 20th of July, we'll present the European contingency plan with which we want to face a potential supply attacks and also to make sure that we have a good supply in case of scarcity. And the EU Parliament approved at the end of June a rule that defines that the gas warehousing or storage uh, must be at 80% for the 1st of November. So it's a lot of tasks, a lot of issues on top of the table to deal with about the geopolitical Europe, which will be led by Paul Morillas on Friday. And to end, let me thank all of the speakers for their time, dedication, the technical team's work, the interpreters, and to actually wish you a very, very enjoyable and profitable course. Thank you. Thank you, Sergi. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And very, very briefly, and with a perfect language um, combination, it's a pleasure to be here today at the headquarters of CEDOB with the second course that we organized jointly with the Commission, the Parliament and CEDOB. It is a great honor, truly, to be able to do it with the participation, the virtual participation of Mrs. Sophia Corradi, this great pedagogist from Italy. And we will see a video afterwards in which she will uh, greet us. And I'd also like to thank, I'd like to thank the teams from CEDOB, Alex Swan, Christina, Sergi, Jordi, and Laura, and my team, who has worked very hard with a very close cooperation with the people I've just mentioned. And I'd like to thank Maria Canals as well, who is with us as a recovery task force. She comes from Madrid and has an in-depth knowledge of how the next generation instrument is being deployed. It is an unprecedented instrument throughout the Spanish territory. And then we will also have other speakers, very high level speakers with whom we work on a daily basis who have either come or they are in Brussels, in Madrid and Paris and in other parts of Europe and Spain to analyze jointly the economic and social and industrial and technological and ecological and geopolitical outlook for the EU. Is evolving into an international reference or benchmark for the quality of its content and also I have to save a number of participants, as you mentioned before. It's quite impressive to have 600 registered for this course. It's great to be able to offer it online. We have a platform and three languages, which I have just used, as you will have noticed. So my advice would be just make the most out of it. It's uh, really quite an enriching experience from what I could tell last year. Uh, I hope everyone, and I'm sure I'm quite confident everyone will participate actively in the course. Um, and thus have your say in both the debate and the policy shaping that is currently taking a turning point because of the unfolding events that uh, Sergi has just mentioned. So in other words, long live the Sofia Corradi summer course uh, on the European Union and thank you for your organization. Fine, so thank you very much indeed. And now we will see the welcome message that Sofia Corradi, uh, actually, Sofia Corradi greeting us in her video. In primo luogo, desidero salutare con affetto. A warm welcome to the participants and organizers of this very prestigious course.
Sofia Corrali. Questo riconoscimento ancora una volta mi scalda il cuore. Il 2022 è un anno particolare perché è allo stesso tempo sia l'anno dei giovani sia il 35 anniversario del programma Erasmus. Mai come in quest'anno avvertiamo fortemente nel mondo l'importanza di qualcosa che davamo per scontato e invece che non è scontato proprio per niente. Mi riferisco all'importanza della pace. In questo difficile frangente la pace non si può dare per scontata e va custodita e promossa come un bene prezioso e indispensabile. Il contributo dei giovani europei per la pace sarà essenziale e investirà i giovani di grande responsabilità, una responsabilità di cui si stanno già accorgendo. Ancora augurio di buon lavoro e un caloroso abbraccio da Sofia Corradi. Well, it is us who thank Sofia Corradi for having accepted our proposal to have her name in our course and to welcome us. I see that MP Urtasun is already connected from Brussels. On my side, I'd like to thank Manuel and Sergi once, a day, once again, because I believe that out of all of the work we carry out together, doubtlessly, well, what's best is the continued will that we share to defend and promote a European attitude. And now I'd like to ask Claudia, who will be the one introducing Ernest Urtasun and his first presentation to then moderate the discussion with Maria Canal, Hector Sanchez, and Paloma Baena. Paloma Baena also online. And therefore, I'd like to ask them to actually change panels and then we can start. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank CDOP for having chosen me to moderate this. I am uh, Claudia Perez, and I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm this deputy director of the Alpais, but I've been invited because before doing that, I was the correspondent in Brussels for seven years, which is a real record-breaking and a, a number of years. And this is, it was a fascinating experience from a journalistic point of view, and from the point of view of somebody who loves politics, Brussels is a sort of a multi-track hub. You follow one track, and then you get lost, and you lose you you lose the the, the, the clowns in the circus. And and but Brussels is a place in which I really really enjoyed enjoyed very much working as a journalist. Being a journalist is a fascinating profession some days. And then I met a young Ernest Urtasun in 2014. And, and Sofia Corradi used to say that that was a peculiar year. I came to Brussels when Spain was built out and then Cyprus, you know, one of the great economic governance disasters. And in 2014, when Ernest came in, there was a second or third Greek bailout. I can't remember. Then there was a migration crisis. Then we had Brexit. 
and then I went back to Madrid because it was too much. It was too much. I don't know if I need to introduce Ernest. He's a European MP from the Greens, the Green Alliance in Europe. He's from Barcelona. His parents are from Navarre. That says a lot of him because we can see his Navarran character. You can see sometimes that he's very much from Navarre. He's an economist. But and just because he's a diplomat, well, in, a, in Brussels there are too many dim, uh, diplomats. But he's a left-wing diplomat, which sounds like an oxymoron. And that turns him into a fascinating character, a peculiar character within this three-track place called Brussels. I mean, he is, uh, he, he, he actually, he is a member of it. Well, as an introduction, let me tell you where we are. We're at the beginning of the story about the king is naked. Why? First, economic governance can be tested out when we are in the midst of a crisis. And the fact is, we have a crisis since I remember, since I arrived to Brussels. In 2012, 13, and 14, the European economic governance had different tones that go from blue to black. We will ask Ernest how he will qualify it. But the, the economic governance was le le left a lot <laughs> to be missed out. The fiscal rules had been designed for a world that was completely different. And now I was saying that the king is naked because we come from a very difficult September with two scenarios. And we cannot have a, an average because one of the two scenarios says, well, that we will come to an agreement that ends the war in Ukraine and then the the inflation will go down and the risks will go down. And the other possibility is that Vladimir Putin ends up in September closing the gas supply and we will have a very cold winter in a real and in a metaphorical sense because that would imply a recession in Germany and that would actually affect the whole of Europe. Germany would have to actually bail out its energy companies and here we would need a lot of knowledge to explain it. Ernest, tell us, the economic governance. How was the economic governance when you came to Brussels and how is it now? Have some things changed? The parliament has taken many steps forward, the bank union. There is a discussion to change the fiscal rules. And there was a president of the European Commission who said that they were stupid rules. And I would use another adjective that's even harder, but I'm not going to say it. What do you think, Ernest? What do you think about the rules? We can't hear you. Ernest parla, un moment. Encara no. Ara sí. Espera, espera. Espera, espera un moment. Cortesies del directe, no? Això? 
A ver, aproba ahora. Casi, casi, Tanim. We almost got you. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Venga, tiro, eh, don. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you to CDOB, to the European Commission, and to the European Parliament for organizing the summer course. It's, uh, these sound pro issues have been uh, are on me because I should have been there with you, but Claudia, the, uh, it's a sort of shared guilt because today we had Eka Kuning um, uh, in the European Parliament and I had to be there to ask her a couple of questions, so that's why I couldn't come. On the popular bank, I assume, uh, yeah, actually. That was one of the things we have been talking about, indeed. But, I mean, since Claudia and I are good friends, and I haven't seen him in a while, I, it would have been lovely to see him in Barcelona, not just him, but all of you. But just to answer your question, Claudia, we have been moving forward, that's true, but the fundamentals are yet to be changed, and we have fallen asleep on our laurels again. And as you say, we're at the gates of a recession, a September that's going to be tough, and I'm guessing when you saw the spreads in Italy and Spain shooting up, you must have been starting breaking out in cold sweats, uh, remembering the time when you were in Brussels. And indeed, we're far from having resolved everything. And we are, you know, the um, economic governance reform is catching up with us. And there is advancement, but not so much. And I'm going to start giving you a little bit of perspective. What was the economic governance when you arrived? What's it like now? It's doing better. When I arrived, we were in the midst of a financial crisis. And I, basically, if those of you who are kept, keep up with European politics, we had 27 fiscal policies that were sort of coordinated with a stability pact, establishing some common points, as well as a, a single uh, monetary policy, with, which had many flaws, as we were able to see for ourselves. And then when the financial crisis arrived, there was no shared mechanism of uh, stabilization. We started with the bank bailout seeing this monumental debt crisis, and add to that, funding crisis from the treasures of the member states because our central bank was designed in a way that was completely unsustainable with its complete inability or uh, in definition when it came to sustaining the debt issued by its member states and this brought huge suffering and I mean, my work as an MP when Claudia and I were together in Brussels, that's basically all I did to fight this notion that fiscal rules were working just fine and it just been a matter of bad management from the member states, especially in the south, when they would mismanage their resources, when no, the problem was a lack, uh, a flaw in the design of the common um, economies. And you mentioned the uh, um, Cyprus bailout as well as the Spanish bailout in Spain with the cutbacks in the welfare state and we reached a point where this became unsustainable and we found two exit tracks sort of uh, provisional which allowed us to sort of get out, get ourselves out of this. The first one was that in the previous mandate when Aaron Oscovici was a commissioner he did something very clever which was I cannot reform the rules but I will do what I call uh, an interpretative commission which basically he said he would leave the member states to run deficits far above what the rules said so their economies could be sustained and this is what allowed Rajoy in Spain to uh, systematically disregard the, the stability and growth pact and this allowed not just Rajoy in Spain but other member states to you know, to leave this economy through the sustaining of a national debt. And, and this was the other track that opened up, which was that the uh, Central European Bank, thanks to Mario Draghi's famous whatever it takes, started sustaining through the massive buyout of debt, the debt issues from the member states. And these two things, these two legs, allowed us to, you know, bail ourselves out. I'm not going to say overcome, because socially the financial crisis was never overcome, but on a macroeconomic level, it allowed us to get ourselves up of the pickle that we got ourselves in. And then the pandemic hit. 
And I think that the pandemic caught us, you know, with our homework left to do. And um, there's the need that states can have finances and, and reasonable funding, but at the same time, we still have not reformed the fiscal laws and we don't have the federal instruments for investments and payback for the, where the crisis would be. And I believe if, for myself, in the previous phase, the great change in the European governance would be Mario Draghi's decision to intervene in the secondary debt market. The second large decision, which I think is a success, and I think we need to say that su at such, and I think there's great that someone from the recovery task force in the room, because they've done extraordinary work with very little time and massive challenges, such as the deployment of the recovery funds, which I think is a success of Europeanness, because at the end of the day, it's Eurobonds these recovery bonds, these famous euro bonds, the time again we were told they were impossible. Well, they're real now. The European Commission is issuing them. They will issue up to 750,000 million euro. The first issues have worked famously, and it's not lending as it was done in the bailout. It's direct investment, and as you know, Spade will be getting 70,000 million euro of direct investment, and that's a raging success of Europeanness, and this is I, something I often say to my partners on the left, this is a success from those who fought against austerity in 2014, the fact that this instrument has been deployed because this is a way of standing up to the pandemic in a radically different way. And so this recovery mechanism, and I'm just going to say a couple of things, I don't want to speak for too long, obviously there's a lot of challenges that come with it, firstly how to implement it, how to deploy it, and with this I think we need to say that the Spanish government has done their homework because they've been the first country to receive two payments already, if I'm not mistaken, on top of the prepayment. And obviously, it comes with a lot of challenges because it's a brand new instrument. It needs to be reach specific investments, specific projects. But I think it's being deployed in a very good way on the part of the European Commission. We do have a very serious problem right now, which is how is this, um, how is inflation affecting these projects? Because you know that very often, Oftentimes, these recovery mechanisms work through op open calls, public calls, which are done based on specific cost and criteria, and people will present their programs, not just adjusting for inflation, but also with um, the change in costs of some prime, uh, raw, ma raw materials, um, some commodities due to the crisis. Well, some of these projects are now in trouble. And this is making uh, that the European Commission is now in talks with member states to see if these plans can be somehow updated, which probably due to the inflation they will have to do. And there's another big um, political brouhaha, which is what's going on with the payment of the member states that do not offer a state of law. And I think with Hungary, we're being strict, not so much with Poland, which is something that from the European Union we've been very strict with the European Commission. The plan has been approved even though they have done no significant reform in laws or fundamental rights guarantee. And you know this is one of the problems that we have because together with the recovery funds we approve what the so-called mechanism of defense of the rule of law, which allows us to withhold these payments for state members that do not um, respect basic human rights. And we have an added challenge right now, if you'll allow me, which is that a program has been presented where, you know, on the European Commission, which we think is actually, are actually good, which has Repower EU, which allows us to speed up these um, efficacy and deployment of renewable energies, but it will also allow that some part of these recovery funds go towards the funding of activities that aren't exactly known for being sustainable or towards the green transition, which, as you know, is one of the great goals of the recovery funds. It's something that we insisted a lot in the Parliament, which is 37 percent of everything that is spent will have to go towards combating climate um, change. And it has the respect, the principle of do not significantly harm, which means not harming any of the fundamental principles um, concerning the environment in the European Union. And now we are in a sort of, some of the payments are partially suspended um, on account of these do not significantly harm principles because uh, they want to fund some structures that are related to gas, which is something that we do not like at all. And it's just a small amendment to these recovery funds, which is now underway in the Parliament. And let let me tell you that this is going to cause 
stir up a lot of shit and put on my French in the European um, Parliament as to how these funds will be moving and will be allocated. But I mean, obviously, when you're wanting to adapt to this energy crisis, some of these sustainable and climate uh, goals have been sort of skirted. But I think that deep down, this is a success for Europe and for the progressives in Europe. However, is everything done? No. With what lies ahead of us, and I go back to what I said in the beginning, to me the answer is no. And the great discussion to still be had on the table is the reform of the fiscal laws, which is far from solved. And I think it's just I can't believe that we know these laws. And Claudia was saying earlier that a commissioner told me that these rules were stupid. And he wanted to offer another adjective. Um, I don't know if what the adjective you want to say is dogmatic, because it's what I often use, because they are dogmatic in the worst sense of the word. Neoliberal, unrealistic, deeply ideologic in their uh, neoliberalism. And they don't work. They don't work. Um, up to the point where Moscovici in 2015 gave a talk on the flexible application for, you know, to get out of, um, of the application of these rules, and now we've had to suspend them. And good thing we did, because if we had not done so, the member states would not have been able to sustain the public spending during the pandemic. They are suspended right now because the Stability and Growth Pact has a clause which allows us to suspend the application of these rules. And we're now waiting on the European Commission to present a reform of the rules where, um, well, this is a debate that we'll be holding in September and October at the gates of a crisis. And I think it's the very worst time to have this debate. We should have had it much, much earlier. But I mean, it's coming now, so we'll have to have it now. And we have been worried, I'll admit, over the last few days, because we were hearing voices saying there would not be a legislative revision. There would just be a new interpretative communication such as we had from Moscovici in 2015, now it looks like no, there will be a legislative um, revision. And there's fundamentally three things on the table on the reform of the fiscal law. For number one is that fiscal law establishes a rhythm of debt reduction from the member states, which today is impossible to apply. Because we're just coming out of a heavy, heavy crisis where some of our members got heavily indebted. And basically what the rule says, and I don't want to get too technical here, is that everything that you go over 60% with regards to um, your GDP needs to be reduced by a 20th yearly. If this is reintroduced with the level of debt in Italy, France and Spain, this will bring us to a massive austerity program over the next three years that we won't be coming out of it alive. Uh, alive. So this rule on debt reduction needs to be changed and we think it will. At least in the European Union there's a great consensus to get it changed, especially because right now to handle the amount of debt that we have with the cost of the issues from last year does not look impossible and we don't suffer the tensions that we had in the past. The second significant reform, we can't forget the war and the current situation notwithstanding, that we need to make significant public investment beyond the um, recovery funds for ecological transition. And that means that member states need to be able to invest in the deployment of renewable energy and for the um, climate uh, transition. And we need to allow that some environmental investments need to be, I don't know if excluded, or maybe yes, or that they have this particular accounting on how the deficit limits are calculated. We still don't know what the methods to do so will, you know, because you could have this fixed methodology for specific investments that will not count towards your threshold of debt as established by the European Union, or it could allow us to reduce more slowly the issue of debt is if this differential is used to invest in ecological transition, that's a different option. But basically, several formulas are being discussed. But during the revision, I'm sure we'll see some of it, basically because it is absolutely necessary to have the member states to do whatever it's needed for the ecological transition. And all these needs have only been but speeded up by the war. It hasn't postponed it. It is accelerating them. Because if we're here, it's because we have this external dependence of fossil fuels, um, which is absolutely suicidal. And the third thing on the table with regards to the change in the fiscal law is the matter of governance. One of the most stupid things about rules is that it establishes fixed parameters for all the member states in regarding deficit, debt, where each country is different. And one of the things we have learned and we have been doing well with the recovery fund is that each program, each country has a specific program. And you know that in the recovery funds, each country has the specific um, investment 
And there are some associated reforms that each country needs to respect, but these are reforms that each government has negotiated with um, Brussels according to its needs. For instance, one of the Spanish reforms in Brussels has been the very successful um, labor force reform, which is one of the things in the program. And this was something that was agreed upon in Brussels because the Spanish um, labor market had very specific needs that have been very well managed. Or at least it seems like things are on the right track. But we, we need to go to move towards very specific country by country based uh, fiscal rules just to make sure that, for instance, goals aren't annualized and are common for everyone, but we will go towards plans for debt and fiscal sustainability that are m look more towards the long term and are specific to each member state, which from a macroeconomic uh, point of view makes a lot more sense than the madness that we had going on until now. We are late. This is catching us already in the midst of a recession, but we'll see where it leads us. And just um, to start wrapping things up, because they said half an hour max, but I'm going to try to, you know, have less time because I I think it's best to have more possibility to, to talk later. And I just wanted to offer some thought because if we keep into account that we have a European Central Bank which has been sustaining us until now, the problem that we've had is that really we, since we haven't developed a shared fiscal policy beyond the recovery mechanisms, which are very positive mechanisms, but which fall short when it comes to macroeconomic stabilization, we put all our chips on the European market um, assuaging the debt market and created good investing conditions for the member states. But now the European Central Bank is starting to change its decisions because of the inflation, which is dangerous because it could start generating tension in the debt markets of the member states without having yet a strong stabilization mechanism at the European level and without having reformed the fiscal law. So we're in the midst of a pickle, if you know, if, if you're aware of the European, they've said they're going to have a defragmentation mechanism to take back the stimulus and not repeat the former crisis, but we still don't know what this fragmentation mechanism is going to be like. We can imagine we'll have the debt market of the um, troubled countries intervening, but this is always going to be a problem for... Um, so this is what we're looking at, but we're going towards an economic recession where the um, central market is, uh, central bank is pulling on the brakes because of a really unbridled recession. We will have to do a hasty reform of the law, and we still don't have any real instruments, more that name, of macroeconomic stabilization on the European level. So are you going to face this crisis with the current instrument is going to be the challenge for 2013 and the Eurogroup? This week, and you probably are aware of that, one of the things they said is that next year we will not be able to keep sustaining the aggregate demand um, as we did during the pandemic. We'll have to start supporting the most vulnerable groups. So we're seeing a shift in economic policy and the risk of returning to austerity. I don't mean to sound alarming, but it is true. It is real. And therefore, Cloudy, my friend, we're starting a new political battle when it comes to economic governance of doing things better than we did in 2013, nothing is won and we'll have to fight really hard so we don't fall back into the mistakes of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernest. I'll lead with a couple of questions, seeing how you had 10 minutes left of your allotted time. But then I'm going to give the... Um, the floor to the room so they can put you between a rock and a hard place. So in terms of governance, it's really important to know who the um, economy minister of a country such as Germany is. We had Van Schoeblin back in 2012, who was the great promoter of this expansive austerity. We now have a liberal, Lindner, who said that the parity in the Euroleague is, doesn't matter. And he said, that together with the Dutch and the Finnish, so with the usual Falcons, they're uh, making it really doubtful that we may have an actual reform of these fiscal laws that are suspended right now. They seem unable to act, to be enacted in a crisis moment like the current one. I wanted to ask, if we now see an increase in interest rates and the drawback from stimulus, 
we might probably be seeing a more active fiscal policy from the member states, which is probably a better mixture, given the current circumstances of inflation, than what we had in the past. The issue is if the cent whether the central bank will be pushing too hard on the interest rate and, and, and lifting its foot from the gas pedal, or whether the fiscal policy is going to be as active as this crisis, crisis requires, seeing how the laws and the rules are not there in time. So just to sum up, this combination of less monetary policy, less fiscal policy, is that good enough? I think it would be a good thing. I'm worried about this latter part. When it comes to um, financial policy, we have been very critical with the decision of the increase in interest rates and the stimulus drawback because we think that basically this is a supply shock uh, crisis motivated by the increasing prices of energy and, and you will hardly have any effect on that by increasing the rates. And the central bank is saying, well, yeah, but there's a matter of expectation, which is always important in this kind of matter. And there's also a matter of um, compensating the Federal Reserve, because if the Federal Reserve increases the rates and the central bank does not, then there's a risk of capital m movement towards the U.S., which could inflate numbers. And this is nothing to, you know, laugh about. And I think we have been very critical about this, whether we can understand that there's been this small increase, that we could think that there are valid reasons for that. It's also true that the European Central Bank has held on despite huge pressure from all sides until it increased its um, interest rates. And it's true that it's announced this anti-fragmentation mechanism. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it can only be one thing. It's basically if the Italian debt um, shoots up, they will be buying more Italian debt. And if it's the Spanish one to do so, they will purchase more Spanish debt to lower it. And, and this is not new. The, Je the Bank of Japan, the does that. One of the mandates of the Japanese Central Bank is to guarantee good funding um, conditions for the Spanish, uh, the Japanese treasure. So, so this is nothing new. Other monetary regions are doing it. Obviously, ours is a lot more complex because we're talking about several countries. But this anti-fragmentation mechanism, we'll see how it shapes up, but it's making me think that there's a strong will in the central bank despite the divisions and the disagreements of not allowing a new crisis like the one we had and so the funding from the member states will remain reasonable i mean this is something we need to keep an eye on because if, if we go back to a risk crisis then the fiscal policies that you were talking about the national fiscal support is going to be in trouble it's another thing entirely this fragmentation mechanism what kind of conditionality because that's the discussion we're having right now is Related to that, but without having enough information, I can say that the European Central Bank cannot by itself impose conditions on member states. It did try, and I think you will remember because you published it first, the, um, that famous letter from Trichet to President Zapatero in Spain. They were sort of skirting, but I mean, that was totally illegal to send that letter. This is not something they can do. Uh, so we'll see how where everything ends up, but I see that the Central Bank is willing to not make the same mistake, to not undo this whatever it takes, because that's really what we're talking about. When it comes to fiscal matters, I am a little more worried, and I'm worried about the conclusions from the Eurogroup. That's all, you know, lessons on paper, and that um, member states are not in a position to sustain the aggregated demand. And um, if the Netherlands have lowered its pressure on the fiscal law reform. There was that paper between um, the Netherlands and Spain, and I think that was an intelligent move on, uh, um, on the Spanish government's part to sort of agree on several common lines with the Dutch. And I think they, they dismantled a little bit this frugal axis with, um, with the German. But I think uh, Christian Lindner, the economy minister in Germany, is a problem right now. Because the thing is, Christian Linder is not doing very well in the poll. The minister, as uh, the Greens um, and Alina Bernbock, um, are doing very well. And, and he feels the political need to strengthen his profile. And really, one of the things that worries me is that he might want to strengthen his profile by hardening on, the, uh, on this reform. Of the, if we don't have that reform, as you were saying, 
the need for the member states to sustain their economic activity and help the more vulnerable might start getting into trouble. So if you ask me, of these two legs, what I'm more worried about is the debate on the reform of the fiscal law, because we need, and it's true that the decisions aren't great, but I do see a political will from the government council to not repeat the same mistakes from the past. One last question from me, and then I will give uh, the floor to the... Ins so, uh, to, to talk to you about the uh, Spanish debate, I'm going to ask about a, a question about Spain. So, this anti-fragmentation mechanism that we don't yet know about is probably tied to the countries fulfilling the recommendations from Brussels, from the European Commission. Can you picture recommendations saying, for instance, that the pension system could uh, make a hole in the deficit and that we might be sort of whispered that Spain can hardly increase their pensions on par with inf inflation because of the structure deficit which is going over 5% uh, of the GDP. What I mean to say is, do you imagine that Brussels might end up telling us be careful with increasing pensions uh, to just for the cost of living. Whether they might be saying that, yes, yes, we might be told it, and that's something that worries me. And it's true that we need to think globally first. The only thing that the Central European Bank can do is that the anti-fragmentation mechanism is going to get started if you fulfill the recommendations from the European Commission. And can the Commission harden their recommendations, uh, which are on the table right now, well, I mean, they're always in a position to do that, but when it comes to pensions, to be precise, I think that right now, and just to give everyone peace of mind, I think that right now the pension reform has been agreed on within the uh, recovery mechanisms. So up until this point, each of the steps that have been taken by Minister Escrivá to regularize pensions have been taken within the framework of the recovery mechanism, so it has been in compliance with the European Commission. It is true that in the reform plan that we have, uh, for the last trimester of the, fall the next year, we have this intergenerational solidarity mechanism, which is yet to be defined, and this intergenerational solidarity mechanism, whoever wants to cut back on pensions, they're going to say that's what it means, but the mechanism could also mean use the fiscal mechanisms at our disposal to guarantee that both pensioners as well as young people find themselves in a good position. And so I don't mean to be alarming, even though it's true and you know it better than anyone, Cloudy, that this is going to be a first-class political battle. But there's one thing that we need to be clear on, and this is more political than financial. I do not think that European institutions and the European Commission in particular want to go back to giving the impression that we're going back to 2014 to the time of cutbacks. They have been trying by all means to avoid that with the pandemic. I don't think no one wants to politically put the European Union in that ditch because you and I know in 2014 with that hideous management of cutbacks and um, austerity, the victim almost ended up being the European project because people were disillusioned, they were angry. And I think this is reflected in the polls right now, the way the pandemic has been handled in a much better way. The dynamic when it comes to the citizens' perception of the European um, Union is quite positive. If, if we go back to the idea that the European Union imposes um, reforms and cutbacks on pensions, I think it would be very damaging to the future of the European project. But just to answer this, um, your question, it's a political battle for next year. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting what you're saying. And I think it will depend on how these Falcons put their attention in the institutions, in the European Parliament. The orthodoxy, it's Lindner, but it's not just Lindner. There's the Austrians, there's the Dutch. And there's people in the institutions who believed to the letter in this pact of austerity and growth and degrowth was out of the austerity pact for a long time. And some people in the European Commission, especially Jose Manuel Barroso, and I would like you, I'm giving you the floor to those of you who are here, um, to please ask Ernest about economic governance or um, whatever you like. So I'm opening 
questions? I know it's always hard to go first. Maybe you could ask the question here and then I'll, I'll, I'll convey it to him. So my question is whether the ecological transition and the considering nuclear energy and gas as green are these is this a transition or could they block the investment in what traditional was considered to be renewables or green energies and what's the eu policy in that respect thank you ernest go ahead well uh, the taxonomy the n the name is a big mess when it comes to identifying things I believe you know I think it's a wrong decision I know that the European Commission did not want to present this but the French pressures were so tremendous that they included gas and nuclear energy within the taxonomy of renewables and sustainable energies Okay, we need to contextualize what we're talking about. We criticize that nuclear and gas energies are in the taxonomy, and they tell us that we're not realistic because gas and nuclear energy must play a role in the transition. But nobody denies that, that nuclear energy and gas should play a role in the transition. Everybody knows it. And now we're talking about, due to the war of the Russians, we have to face difficult situations where importing Get liquefied gas from the states, which comes from fracking, which is very unsustainable. And not only Germany, but also Italy, are um, reopening coal centers. These are terrible situations. Short term, we have a problem. Now, the fact that short term, we have an emergency and that we need gas and nuclear energy as transitional energies, because the sources that we have and because of the nuclear powerhouses we have, we should not consider them to be sustainable. That's a great trap. Big taxonomy is how do you qualify certain investments? So if what you are doing is to place a label, a green label on uh, gas and nuclear, you're taking out resources that should be invested in renewables that we need to deploy to take them to energy that at the end of the day you will and you will need to disconnect them. So we will be making sustainable investments in these energies and you will extend their uh, use because you will need to amortize their investment. That's a terrible mistake. As of now, when France builds up a new generation nuclear powerhouse because they have centers like Flamoville that are so big they cannot start them up. When you make an investment, it will be considered to be sustainable and therefore financial institutions will be able to channel investments in that direction and consider them to be sustainable and to tell their customers that these are sustainable investments. This is terrible. We are very unhappy about that because it just protects the French nuclear um, investments and the German gas investments. And why is it a mess? Beforehand, I said that one of the things we want to do with the change or the reform of the tax rules is to have part of the investments made that are for the ecological transition out of the of the balance. But in order to make that calculation, we use the taxonomy. What does that mean? If we now use this methodology, it means that we are excluding from the, the deficit limit investments in nuclear and gas. And that's absolutely crazy, if you allow me the expression. So we are very unhappy with this. As you know, we tried to stop it till the last minute. We made an objection. We voted last week. We were not successful. But the road is open because there are legal doubts that this delegate act is not legally solid with the original uh, rule, which is a taxonomy. Luxembourg and Austria said that they will actually sue this in the, the Luxembourg court, and the last word will be in the court's hands. Well, and then we have the British exception that has been applied you know, 10 years ago, and it's coming back now. 
Hello, my name is Pablo. I do not understand a whole lot about economics, so that's why I ask the following question. You've been talking about inflation, austerity, social agreement, etc. If we follow up the current affairs, we read that Germany will invest a lot of money in modernizing its army. Spain, too, with NATO, it will invest a lot of money to increase the military budget. The EU is also starting military research projects because of cyber security and quantum technologies, etc. So I, I, I wonder, I'd like to know if all of the money that's being invested in the military, if it were not spent in this and it was, was spent in public policy, could that compensate for the inflation effects and all of the recession that's coming up? And I'd, I'd like to know if this is being questioned, because before the war started, only military expenses in France and Germany and the UK, which supposedly are our allies, they already went beyond the military expense by Russia. So, personally, I do not understand why all of this wave in spending more money in weapons. Thank you. Ernest. Well, we are getting out of the discussion a little bit, but I have no problem in answering you because you're right, this is a significant. I will not link this debate with inflation. I mean, the decisions we make with regards to military expense have no relationship with inflation immediately. When you all, when you make, when you decide to make an expense, it's a, an issue about priorities. And the money that's invested in, ex in, in military could be invested in the, the ecological transition, but that would be better. Listen, I do not agree with the decisions to anchor the national NATO state members' expense to 2%. That implies we, in Spain, we have to double up our military expense. And I do not agree with this because at an EU scale, we do not have a military expense problem as such. If you take the aggregate military expense at the EU, we are the third ones in the world. We are the second ones in the world, if I'm not wrong, after the Americans. And we are still ahead of the Chinese. But if somebody knows better, please do correct me. But we have a very large military expense. And therefore, our problem is not that. Our problem is the lack of, ab the absolute lack of coordination in the defense of the 27 member states. If we take this into account in the Ukraine war, we have a problem. Because the planes from some member states are not being, you know, they're they are not useful for the palace for another country. The tanks from one member state cannot go in the ships of another member state. We have 12 tank models at the EU, 12. Americans only have a one single tank model. We have 12 tank models with all of the technical problems that implies for the interoperability of it all. So our problem is to build up coordination structures of unit, uh, unitary command. We have intergovernmental institutions that are fully dispersed. What we have within uh, the EU is credit management. It doesn't go beyond that. And therefore, the effort, in my opinion, which is also being made, there is a strategic road map presented by Minister Borrell for this. The goal should be the build-up of a real EU defense that is independent from NATO and the Americans. That's the main priority. Not to actually just fix a 2% national defense, because then you will be increasing the national defense without solving the problem of interoperability. And I do not flee from the debate about the European defense. I am in favor of it. It's the best way to be independent from the world and to have our own weight. But to me, Defending Europe, it does not imply spending more. Uh, you know, the, the, the strategic autonomy concept by Merkel, right? We have a question here from outside of the room. Ernest, let me read out to you an online question. Which mechanisms do we have to have a distribution of the large wealth accumulated accumulations? Do you want me to repeat it? No, I have heard you. Let's see. The main redistribution policy elements at the level of the EU are still nationally based. Because at the end of the day, the 
tax structures and the welfare structures, the main mechanisms to redistribute wealth are still nationally based. We can do some things at the EU, and we have actually done some of them. With regards to this, there is something that I've followed from very close by and that, and that I'm very much concerned about, which is the blockage of the directive for the minimum imposition for multinational corporations. As you know, multinational corporations in Spain, we have a real company tax of 25%, but multinational companies pay below 10%. And if we go to countries like Ireland, given that they have bilateral agreements, large technological companies pay a company tax of 0.5%, which is absolutely preposterous. And we pay the nominal at 25% in Spain and 0.5% in the case of Ireland. And the OCD, there was an agreement to set up a minimum tax of 15% for multinational corporations, which has become a European directive that the European Parliament has already voted favorably on. And now the Council has to validate it. And the directive has been stopped because Hungary does not allow this to be unblocked. And in such a sensitive issue like tax, the EU could do many things to combat tax havens and uh, promoting that 15%, etc. So we have a lot of room for the EU to become a significant actor to guarantee the redistribution of wealth. Now that we talk about an agreement of income on, on income, and the trade union says that it can only it should not only be the salary containment, but also capital should also make a contribution. In addition to that, the EU is a good umbrella cover to cover this, like the five percent or the setup of a common basis with regards to company tax, or maybe the recommendations that the council has made to member states to impose a tax on other profits that, um, well, energy companies have had, you know, out of the blue, and uh, the president of the Spanish government said it would do so. So these are things that can be done, and the European Parliament should make sure that this is actually carried out. And then the recovery mechanism is a inter-territorial cohesion mechanism for the distribution of wealth throughout Europe. The joint debt in Europe will be transferred for 70 billion euro directly to the Spanish economy. And this is also a wealth distribution mechanism. So there are things that the EU can actually do and it should keep on doing them. Good afternoon. I have a question about the role played by the European Central Bank. Given the current situation, with very low interest rates and with evasion operations that imply having capital in many places to actually promote. We have a problem of inflation that comes from the gas dependency on Russia and the war on Ukraine. Doesn't that actually imply that inflation is being promoted and should be raising interest rates and reducing our aid in order to stop the expansion of inflation, which is the most mm, significant problem that the Union faces now. Let's see. I believe that inflation, we need to distinguish between the situation in the States and the situation in the EU. The situation in the, e in the USA, there is uh, an inflation that has skyrocketed because of the overheating of the economy. And in other states, it makes sense to raise interest rates. In Europe, it makes less sense to increase interest rates because we just have a supply shock phenomenon. And the underground underlying inflation rate is already at five, which is a high rate. But basically, more than double the inflation is still a supply shock result. So I do not see how a higher interest rate could actually improve a 10% inflation rate when it's a problem of an energy cost. With the interest rates, you cannot have an effect on energy prices. Something else is that the European Central Bank tells us that it's important to generate inflation controls expectations. That's an argument. And the second argument that the BC gives that the, is how the, the, the European Central Bank makes decisions to actually balance out capital movement. But to make a massive increase in short-term interest rates will not solve the problem. That's not the main problem we face right now with inflation. With inflation, we published recently an article about this. 
the best way to combat inflation, and of course this is something midterm, is to place renewable energies at a European scale as soon as possible and to decrease the cost of energy. That would be the most deflationary policy that we could do. So the, f the future of inflation we will be actually fitting the policy mix, but it will be related to the energy price. That's the way it is from my own point of view. Well, so the story that the Ukraine war has been the cause for the inflation rate. I mean, before February, the inflation rate in Europe was 24% already. So it was already 4%. So who else would like to ask a question, please? Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jose Maria Aguirre. Okay, could you talk about climate change? But let me share with you an objective piece of data. In Europe, there is a lot of cancer. A large part is work-related cancer. About 3 million people suffer from cancer. 1,300,000 people die every year in Europe due to cancer. In Spain, this year, 280,000 people will die from cancer. Let me just mention the following. This EU policies with regards to climate change, fossil fuel or diesel, which is also cancer producing and I'm a physician, or the waste stemming from ionizing energies, all of this in the policies that will be carried out in Europe should be taken into account because the cancer rates we have in Europe and throughout the world because of climate change is to a large extent due to energy policies. That's my opinion. Thank you. Well, Ernest, could you make a comment about this? Well, here we have, I mean, a very clear issue to show what you have just mentioned. Sometimes we do not apply well the European rules with certain things that have an effect on our health. And I'd like to mention the massive non-compliance in Spain's case of the directive on the air quality directive from 2001. We know that air pollution in large cities is a factor to increase the mortality rate because of the increase of cancer cases for the European Union. And we have gone beyond the limits of these emissions in large urban areas in Barcelona and Madrid systematically. And in fact, there is an open um, infraction procedure opened by the EU about this ruling. And because of all of, I say this because all of the discussions we have about the measure to plan transit, traffic in Barcelona and Madrid, which is crucial not only to make cities healthier, but also to comply with the European rule, which has been massively, massively non-complied with in the last few years. Now, with regards to the EU's role in this discussion, you have to remember, and we have not talked about this, but one of the main discussion topics we have at the European Parliament is the Fit for 55 package, which is to be ready for 2050. 55 re refers to the reduction of 55% of emissions for 2030 at the EU. And there are a number of measures that are being adopted about which the Greens are trying for them to be more ambitious, one of which is uh, the end of combustion engine cars by 2035. Well, it sounds like this is something that will become a reality because both the Parliament and the, and the Council have shared the position in that respect. So within the framework of the Green Deal, not only the environmental rules that already exist and exist and that, that we apply wrongly, but also the new measures for the ecological transition within the Green Deal, the EU is pushing forward in the right direction to make a faster transition and also to protect our health faster. But of course, we our role as, e as the ecology party in the parliament is to make this to go faster. But we're developing new po policies in that direction. That's clear. Ernest, two online questions for you. The first one is, 
Is it sustainable to maintain a monetary policy with the euro when uh, the European Central Bank, there are decisions made that affect the whole country, all of the member states? A fiscal policy uh, that's separate for each and a common box. Is there leadership in Europe in terms of economic governance? Well, I would have also asked you this at the beginning, yes. Well, the first one is a clear one. We've been saying so since the beginning. Most we created a shared common monetary space, but it did not create a shared stabilization mechanism. We always give the same example. If there is a shock, if there is a shock in Florida, for example, there are stabilization mechanisms. For example, the unemployment subsidies will be paid by the federal government. So it is an internal stabilization mechanism within a shared monetary region. In Europe, we haven't got that. The recovery mechanism is a small seed in that direction, and it goes in the right way. We have been making direct transfers to the member states based not only on the population, but also on the economic outlook, the economic development, which is all, I mean, you know, that mechanism is also based on the economic outlook. So there is a macroeconomic intervention based on the recovery mechanism. So we are pushing in the right direction, but we still haven't got it. And the Eurozone is still a single monetary region with 27 fiscal policies and some crazy policies that we have not yet reformed. So we have a very heterogeneous and dysfunctional European monetary area. And that's what we've been referring to this afternoon. Now, with regards to the lack of def the lack of economic leadership, there is a little bit of economic leadership. In other cases, we in the past we have had stronger leaderships within the Eurogroup, not only positive ones. Claudia will remember some leaders in the Eurogroup that did not push in the right direction, but it is also true that governance is based on the central bank, which makes decisions autonomously, but at the same time, from a fiscal point of view, from a tax point of view, the architecture is overly complex. A European Commission that suggests and, and, and surveils, a European Council that has a last word, a Eurogroup that makes many decisions, and as you should know, it is not even an official configuration of the Council, it's an ECOFIN informal group. There isn't a commissioner, an, economic, an economics commissioner that can give consistency to European economic policy. And therefore, that's one of the main pending issues. How do we rationalize a little bit the leaderships and the, the EU's economic governance? Okay, linking up both questions, you know, the, the tax policy and the lack of economic leadership, Jean-Claude Junkers used to say, we know what we need to do. We know exactly well how to do it, but we do not know how to win the elections after applying the stability policies we need. The only problem is that Junkers was one of the people who pushed strongly in that direction in 2012 and 2013 during the years of the expansion policy. Do we have any further questions or should we come back to the floor? Well, fine, thank you. I have a question, because yesterday the euro and the dollar reached a value parity. What does that parity mean? The fact that the euro and the dollar are worth the same in terms of economic governance, what does it mean? And how do we actually face it? Well, given the current situation, it's a bad piece of news. Given the current state of things, it is a bad piece of news because, uh, well, our, our external debt uh, falling in the value of energy is an increase in the energy bill. And, well, this, you know, the, the, the fact that the euro is cheaper now, given the current situation, I mean, normal circumstances, it would be something positive because it would allow to promote European exports. But in the current situation, and I do not know whether Claudi is, agrees with me or not, but it's a bad piece of news. It's a bad piece of news with some good profiles. There are exporting companies that w whose competitiveness will increase. 
thanks to this reduction in the value of the euro. A, well, a, a country like Spain with its dependency on tourism, it will have a good summer. The only problem is inflation, and for inflation, the main problem is energy. And for energy, one cheaper euro and oil that's paid in dollars, it implies we will be paying more. So that's bad. Okay, two additional questions, and then that will be it. That will be it. Okay, and there is one last online question, and then that will be it. Okay, so two questions here, and one, two in present question, and then one online. Good morning, my name is Paula Vazquez. And I wanted to ask you a question related. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. I wanted to ask you a question related to the news in the newspaper El Periodico today. Pedro Sanchez has imposed a number of measures to actually treat the inflation problem. And when I started reading the measures he has imposed, a lot of them do not seem to be consistent to reduce the debt. I mean, to apply measures that what in fact they do is to increase our debt as a student I think it's wonderful to have scholarships because that's something that must be done. But I do not know what is the relationship with reducing the inflation rate. And I'd like to ask you, with regards to this measure, I mean, imposing greater taxes to the banks and increasing energy company taxes, would that be a solution? Or are we just trying to actually put on a Band-Aid? Well, listen. Oh, OK, Claudia, you want to group together questions. OK, let me ask you the three questions, and then we will end with one final comment on your side. Second one here. I have a question similar to the one that has just been asked. I wanted to ask you about the proposal made by Pedro Sanchez to increase taxes on banks. Because in your opinion, the EU is maybe suggesting this at a European-wide level. What's your opinion? Because of course, inflation there are companies that have extraordinary profits, for example, the banks with an increase in interest rates, our companies that be due to the increase in energy prices are getting greater profits. Are taxes the way to take out those extraordinary profits and redistribute them among students and citizens because they are more vulnerable to the effects of inflation? And I'd like, would the EU like to uh, propose a community-wide Proposals similar to what Pedro Sánchez is doing and to what other countries individually are doing. One last online question. What's your positioning with regards to the superficiality of the transformation uh, presented by the EU centered on carbon neutrality but forgetting about the lack of unsustainability of the economic system and massive consumption patterns? Okay, fine. Okay, let me answer the three of them. With regards to the measures, there is a link between inflation and the extraordinary profits of multinational corporations. Some studies by the European Central Bank say that there is a link. The, one of the causes for inflation, a high inflation rate, is the extraordinary profits obtained by energy companies. And this is a study you can find, and as Elizabeth Schnabel said so, she's a member of the governance councils in a recent conference. So these extraordinary profits are a factor that increase inflation. So to tax them, it makes sense from the point of view of the inflation rate. But it is also true that it also makes sense from another point of view. That's quite relevant as well. Right now, we will need to decide in the next few months how we share the inflation costs. And uh, there is an income uh, agreement that has to be reached these days. And I agree with the trade unions fully. Citizens are losing purchasing power with the 10% inflation rate we have. Everything is more expensive at the supermarket. And what the Bank of Spain is telling us, that it's not feasible <laughs> to index salaries with inflation. 
because that would create second round effects and then the inflation rate would increase even more so. What are trade unions saying? Well, do not ask me for a salary compensation if the capital does not make a contribution in, in, in this income agreement. And from that point of view, the announcement made by Pedro Sánchez goes in the right direction <laughs> to have an income agreement as it should be with the two tax issues. I mean, a tax on extraordinary profits and a tax on banks. How do these taxes are reflected at a European scale. You may introduce them at a national level. That doesn't mean there is a European coordination. I'd like to remind you that there are some conclusions drawn by the European Council two or three months ago that encouraged all member states to tax all extraordinary profits from electrical companies. Now, some member states have done so, others haven't. A lot of them have done so. It, the Italians have done it at the UK, even though it's not the European Union anymore, but they have done so. So this is not a measure we are doing marginally, no. Other countries have already done so, taxing extraordinary profits. So there is a European coordination, and this is an important tax. And I believe it was an international energy agency. No, no, it was not the international energy agency. It was, it was the OCD, maybe, that they calculated 200 billion euros, the extraordinary global profits of energy companies as a result of the increase in the energy cost this last year. So we're talking about gigantic energies that need to be taxed. So very well done, the government this week, and also the tax on banks. This tax on banks is a, also a tax that exists in other European member states. I read uh, this in a tweet made by Claudi. It already exists. In spite of all of the bailouts, in spite of all of the, of the cost of the bailouts in Spain, our friend Andreu Misek constantly updates the figure between 70 and 80 billion euros because the cost goes up. You see, I mean, they, they update it constantly and it always rises. In spite of this, you should think that one of the decisions that hurt me the most in the last few months is that considering that our banking system is quite healthy and well capitalized because of the public investment that has been made in the past few years, the European bank supervisor actually approved them to make a dividend distribution by the largest ba Spanish banking, when everybody said it was not the time to distribute dividends. It is not the time to distribute dividends. So at a time in which the bank is healthy because there was public intervention on it, and in addition to all, they distribute dividends, the minimum thing they can do is to contribute with a tax. And I believe that this tax is well placed, and as somebody said, in a scenario in which interest rates are going up and the banks will benefit from that, clearly, therefore, I believe this is a second very good decision announced by the government this week. And finally, the last question. I think you're asking me whether it's consistent to talk about carbon neutrality and not to reform the governance of the financial system, right? This is what you asked me, right? Well, yes, it is a pending, a pending issue in many, in many, many fields. And in fact, in spite of the fact that many financial regulation measures are being undertaken after the decisions taken by the GVN after the financial crisis, there are still many black holes to be solved. And one of them is the problems we have with commodity market speculations in the last few weeks. They are increasing the price of some raw materials and some foodstuffs due to a speculation process. So the financial markets are still a global problem. And that's why the EU said, well, now that we're talking about this, let's end with it. Out of all of the discussion we've had here today, there is a clear take-home message. In the world we're going to, either because of the question you asked me about defense, or because of the economic governance, or the financial speculation, or the ecological transition, without a strong public authority that is big enough and strong enough, we will not be able to face these challenges that we've been discussing here at the national level. And that's why the consistent position nowadays from a progressive left-wing position, which is mine, is profoundly pro-Europe. No further questions. I'd like to thank the audience for asking us these questions. Thank you, Mr. Urtasen, for your questions. I hope to see you soon, Ernest, and have a beer together now that the pandemic is over. Thank you. Thank you.
tenim un petit... We have about a 10 minutes recess and then we'll come back stronger than before.
Bueno, buenas tardes otra vez. Good afternoon, evening again. We will now be resuming the course this time with the panel also on economic governance in the European Union. And I will introduce the panelists. Maria Canal von Cunarta is a member of the Task Force Covers of the General Secretary of the European Commission, now in Madrid, uh, previously in Brussels, as she was telling us uh, a minute ago. Hector Sánchez is a CEDOP researcher. Good evening. And Paloma Baena, who is online, is a director of the Next Generation U at the Llorente Cuenca consulting firm, I assume in Madrid, but she will tell us. Hello, how do you do, Paloma? Hi, first of all, I am so sorry I can't be sitting on uh, that panel with you, but I hope you can see me and hear me all right. We hear you perfectly. I will now start with Maria Canal. I wanted to ask on the economic perspectives of what's to come. The uh, Commission will be modifying very soon the economic perspectives. So, the riskier scenario a few months ago was, you know, Putin uh, shutting off the gas faucet, which would make the energy prices even more expensive and could cause a certain scarcity, which would be associated to recession um, in Germany of three, four GDP points, whose effects would surely be felt across the Eurozone. And as we were saying, that was the riskiest scenario, the most negative one, is now practically our baseline scenario, which could, you know, bring about a change in these perspectives. So I wanted to ask, what are these European perspectives in the Eurozone and the European Union? What will be the structural reforms uh, uh, proposed by Russell, Brussels to the countries, as, you know, given that, how we were saying, with, con with their nest, they're m most important, because this um, defragmentation mechanism from the... B from the CB, uh, CEB um, brought a lot of headaches a while ago in some of the governments, uh, 680 kilometers from here, so the floor is yours. Thank you, good evening, and thanks to CIDOP for giving me the chance to be here in the name of Hector. So on the uh, perspectives, I'm afraid I will not be able to really advance much. They will be published tomorrow morning, so it's only a matter of hours to you know find out the new figures that will be uh, published but we can i think we can imagine is we will be observing some damage in those perspectives for the economic situation the eurostat data or we talk about 8.6 percent in the european union the statistics uh, institute of spain has already confirmed that inflation in spain on the other hand we'll be seeing a damage which comes hand in hand with this huge inflation in the spending powers of families, lack of confidence on the consumer's part, which might affect um, growth and private spending. But I also want to tell you that there are positive perspectives. We find a very resilient labor market in Europe, thanks to all the support from the security nets uh, funded with European money, the mechanism that started during the crisis, we also find the implementation of the recovery and resilience mechanisms which are moving along and which slowly start to have a, a more real or tangible effect. It has reached the economy, it's starting to reach the companies and I'm sure Paloma will tell us a bit more about that. And I think this is really all I can say. For now, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until tomorrow for the rest. Uh, with regards to the um, recommendations or how this is going to affect what each state is asking from Europe, we have heard Mr. Thassen's opinions earlier. And I just wanted to say that the European Union has uh, gained back the cycle of economic governance called the European Semester. They have already proposed, issued a series of recommendations to all the member states, and these recommendations contain, even though the escape clause is still active, they already held fiscal recommendations, the same, basically, for all member states with a high debt threshold, such as Spain, with 118% this year. So in these recommendations, 
we can say that there's a quantitative recommendation, so there is a difference between the actions that need to be taken this year with regards to next year's budget and starting next year. So with regards to next year, all countries with high debt are asked to adopt careful fiscal positions to not increase uh, their uh, national budget spending above their potential growth. And now, with the following years, they should allow all states to carry on with their investments to um, support the digital transition, the green transition. And moreover, the member states are also requested to be swift and to have uh, the tools to support the most vulnerable groups with measures regarding the impact of the crisis and the war in the energy market, as well as the need to support refugees. These measures have to be selective rather than general. This is a little bit the lens that then the Commission needs to apply. Uh, looking into the future, we countries are requested to start this road of gradual fiscal consolidation, which will need to go hand in hand with a revision of the governance rules, uh, which I think Hector will be talking about. Now that's going to be the tough thing, won't it? Even though the degree of compliance uh, that is proposed has been historically very low. Why? Why was it so low? Yes, I think that it's hard to find a single answer on why it was so low, if the collective mechanisms work better, the executive mechanisms. What we are looking for with regards to the future, even though the Commission does not yet know what recommendations they will be issuing after the summer, we can see in the um, public polls that have been asked, in the gathering of all the questions that have been published since the end of March, there are some consensus, wide consensus areas, one of which is improving or looking for ways of fiscal consolidation that are gradual, that adapt to the specific situation in each country, with a larger undertaking on the state spot of that path. And it is also stressed um, the quality of public finances in that fiscal consolidation. It is expected that with all these tracks, we might be able, after the summer, to put something on the table that gets enough support to offer mechanisms that work for the future. In my time as um, a press envoy, the Vademecum tried to explain the uh, fiscal rules of the European Union had almost 400 pages. It was impossible to read. And we always say that it's always one of the hardest things about being a press envoy in, in Brussels and one of the most frustrating because it's really hard to translate. We're going to go into the most political dimension of economic governance. There's an institutional part, a leadership issue, which has tangentially touched the, uh, Ernest. There's an institutional part that institutions such as the Eurogroup, who have issues of really terrible democratic policies issues, or the Euro Working Group, which has even bigger problems. Um, and I wanted to give us some clues as to uh, how this boats through the future of Europe. Well, we've been talking so much about this, and we are gathering many of the things that we have been talking about. Yes, thank you, Claudie, and good evening, everyone. Before I answer that, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that if you have the chance to go on an Erasmus exchange, please do so, because of one of the best experiences you can have. I did, and I had a wonderful time, so if you have the chance, um, and so given that Ms. Sofia Parens um, welcomed us, please do so. On the future of Europe, surprisingly, there's no mention in the final draft on the sustainability pact and funding, or no mention to fiscal reform policies. What we do have, and that's important, politically speaking, and that ties in with the debate of the uh, fiscal reform, is that we need to take into account all the externalities, the negative externalities that affect, you know, the, the social sphere when we talk about economy. And therefore, this is a recommendation that made it into the uh, final conference of the uh, final draft of the uh, conference, the future of Europe. And another request is that 
the European Union increases its um, debt capacity and there's also the catchphrase of, uh, you know, upholding responsible fiscal policies and obviously there's an institutional aspect which is politically significant which is the one that demands that European institutions give a larger role to the European Parliament to have uh, fiscal oversight um, mechanisms, control mechanisms for um, adjustment plans to individual countries, so that the Parliament might work as, 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 as a fiscal overseer of the things that are approved in the Commission. So it's true that the economic institutional part is uh, slightly marginal to what the, how the debates were centered on the future of Europe, but there is a will to at least make sure that the institutions governing the European Union to make them more dem democratic. And do you think that this is uh, the success guaranteed or is this going to be a partial success? because there's a stand and pretend. Back in the day in Brussels when we talk about um, uh, your economic promise, uh, policies, it was all about pretending. And in Spain... Uh, which means that the fiscal rules must be reformed and they need to be made believable because such as Ernest was saying they are not right now and we have rules that are stupid and useless or you know we can find the objectives that we need and Ernest was pointing it out and that's the political battle for the next um, months and probably years personally I would like to highlight that there's been a paradigm shift and in my opinion it has been preceded by two key moments. On the one hand, when the escape clause from the fiscal regulations was enacted so, so states could spend, which was unthinkable up to, you know, practically yesterday. And then there's the creation of the next generation funds, which really do overcome the taboo of common debt. What does that mean? Well, it means that probably southern states, which had to suffer the morality of the northern countries through the former crisis, were partly right when they said that austerity was not working. And it also means that Keynesian policies to face economic crisis are as valid as any others. And so it is needed, and this is something that Ernest also said, we need a public organism which is capable of investing in European public goods, no matter what the economic circumstance the Union countries are going through. Yes, uh, moral was a constant uh, 10 years ago, and, and, and they have remained so. So, morality notwithstanding, there's that famous Merkel for us, there's not going to be any mutualization as long as I live, which really did not stand the test of time because there has been mutualization even if it was through the back door. And the back door was the next generation EU, the crown jewel, Paloma. There's a paradox here. The media, we have reported extensively on how slow we're going, or very slowly, in the spending of the funds, even though the programs have been implemented and everything is, you know, going at a good speed, but only 2% of the funds have been spent in Spain. Uh, how's that really looking like? Uh, were, we, were the media too pessimistic now that it's fashionable to be pessimist? Were we really too pessimistic or is there really a background bottleneck problem where a government royal decree tried to save it but I guess things are not as simple? Please tell us how things are being implemented, these funds are being implemented in Spain and, and what are the challenges? How can we overcome them? Well, I had a presentation prepared, but I see this is uh, more of a panel discussion. So, 
so so I will do that and if there's something where you want me to go into bigger detail I can show the slides. The first thing is that where you were saying about Merkel's um, quote fortunately it does not stand the test of time because it's a great news to think that Europe was able to react the way it did in a relatively swift way compared to what we're used to and to issue common debt to uh, it, it, to enable these recovery mechanisms and this is making us wonder what other things will we be seeing especially with what we were talking about with regards to fiscal laws you were asking whether um, it had, had been a general thing because it was not just the media whether there was pessimism with regards to the plan well I think so and I think I'm probably one of the precious few who sees it that way and let me tell you why it is true that we talk about low figures of execution but it's also true that we need to say that that two percent can't even be considered a real figure as of today because official data the the official date uh, state accounts we are not available to us and that's the only way of knowing how much money has exactly reached com businesses about a month ago we published a highly detailed report to distinguish a little bit between the perception of what thing is happening in reality um, with regards to the recovery plans and what we were suggesting is that to understand the advancement of the plan we need to differentiate between two concepts so the accrued spending or the executed spending and given how we don't have updated figures which is something else that we can talk about whether we have them or not we have updated figures of execution the only data that we can use as real reference to um, evaluate is the committed spending together with the um, um, data of actual spending and I think I need to do a little aside to mention something about the plan because it's an investment plan as well as a reform plan and you were talking about the European semester and you were talking about how well the recommendations in the European semester are being followed. The recovery plan for Spain and other countries includes part of these recommendations to, um, as a projection to ask for this spending. So Spain has not had the totality of its funds transferred, but rather as it fulfills its goals more payments are coming exactly just like other multilateral institutions especially in the world of development do but in this case it is concerning uh, developed countries in the eurozone so just to find out whether we are moving forward or not we need to look at investments as well as reforms on the one hand as you know the first spendings have been approved and the last one will be approved without a hitch so there's progress on that side and concerning the side of investments as I was saying it's best to use the um, committed spending figures and in that sense in 2022 we have seen an actual acceleration with regards to that commitment and how does that commission uh, commitment translate um, in uh, competitions or licitations as well as the uh, autonomous communities we have seen that in all of um, 2022 in the months that we have seen of 2022 uh, this amount of competitions have been open as in all of 2021 and if the um, uh, government keeps going along this road the initial part of the next gen funds could be completely committed by the end of 2023 so on paper the progress is adequate with regards to the execution as I was saying we don't have updated we don't have current data so we don't know if that percentage is going to be for 2021 um, 2022 for all autonomous communities or not that's a great problem that creates a lot of distrust with regards to the execution of the plan but we know that many of these open calls are handled by the autonomous communities so it's them that we need to ask for these figures and many other communities at the central level are already closed and the projects are already being assigned so maybe by way of an introduction that would be my initial answer though I completely agree with you that we would need those execution um, figures well, keeping into account that the volume is so important because that's uh, 67, 68 thousand euro, how come 
We don't almost have any updated figures. And then with regards on future reforms of 2023, well, you said we're doing well on paper. However, given the degree of polarization right now, the, the amount of dissent within the government itself, not just in the government, obviously, within the Spanish parliament, where sometimes there's rough words in every debate, how likely is it to fulfill these reforms that we were committed to with, uh, for instance, pensions? And I'm sorry for repeating myself because I've been asking Ernesto about these matters too. When it comes to pensions, that's where the really difficult part of the reform is found. Uh, when we really opened that Pandora's box a few months ago, there was a great upheaval. Como... Are you feeling so optimistic, as you said, uh, looking back? Yeah, I fully agree with you, and I don't know if we can be such optimistic, but I would love to. And uh, yeah, yes, I agree. Let's talk about data first. There's something I always uh, say, and I hope you listen to me. I would love to be there, by the way. This uh, plan. It's a different one based on results, uh, with uh, goals, uh, based on impact, with this cross-section ideas uh, lands in the Spanish administration and the administration we already have. And uh, we cannot accelerate this implementation, although we try to do it uh, with these acceleration uh, measures. And we can shorten some... Uh, times, uh, but uh, that's the way it goes. And I've uh, worked in public governance for many years and in the compared management of some governance practices and the public, the Spanish public administration is not particularly agile and uh, not based on results and it's never been. And there are other administrations that are. And this means that it's not that we have data that is uh, not uh, uh, communicated. It's that what administration cannot uh, facilitate them in a compared way, in an agile way, and uh, fully updated. And uh, we are focused uh, on the control, and this uh, means that the implementation of the plan is really difficult, and then very decentralized that has some advantages and some problems. One would be the management of the information and uh, a real time. And this is something that uh, we should try and make more agile. But uh, from my perspective, I don't think it is that we are hiding something that does not exist. It's the way the information is managed that is not uh, agile. And, uh, uh, it should be changing in our public administration. And as for the reforms, uh, the design of the plan is uh, very good. And uh, first of all, we have uh, prioritized uh, these reforms in the uh, agreements of uh, this endorsement uh, with more reforms in the beginning than in the end. And this has allowed uh, Spain to do this because we can adopt the reforms uh, uh, better than the ones that needed agreements or uh, bait or resolutions and so, and so on. And we have also introduced some reforms that uh, existed already. And uh, so we've been able uh, to overcome some obstacles like the work reform with some agreements of the government coalition. And there are some challenges, undoubtedly, and I fully agree with what you said, that there will be problems in the uh, fourth disembarkment related to sustainability of the pensions. And uh, the Commission, in the recommendation of this second uh, uh, disembarkment, says that uh, They don't agree with uh, these uh, changes that are proposed, and uh, 
bring into the sustainability of the system. So this is uh, the uh, main idea from the Commission. In the Commission is not uh, going uh, to accept that. This is my interpretation because they are going to focus on this. And sometimes we think that the Commission is going to give us details about everything, and this is not true. They are going to choose the topics in which they are going to deepen, and uh, the pensions is going to be one linked to sustainability of the system. See, this intergenerational uh, facility that was uh, mentioned, and uh, I also wanted to ask you something. So, how optimistic are you about uh, this idea? Well, about optimism. Um, well, the regulation says that the Commission, as Paloma said, has to verify these abiding by these uh, duties that are reforms, investments, results or steps being, bringing to the results and in there Spain has been a pioneer. It's been the first one to receive the first payment, to receive an evaluation, a positive evaluation of the second payment with uh, the council that has to give an okay before the commission uh, does the uh, disembursement. So from this perspective, uh, these are um, our duties and the Commission has published uh, these evaluations and it's clear. The second uh, point of view, Paloma also already said it, the co-legislators uh, wanted to, to give uh, the money to the states as soon as possible uh, could make two things. So first of all, to include the reforms, uh, retroactive reforms, and then most of the member states uh, and the um, governments was to accumulate reforms in the first disembursements in order to fulfill the, uh, the goals uh, uh, faster. This is what we did in Spain with the reforms and now we are going to start showing the results of these investments. And uh, I think that we can be very positive and uh, we will see the acceleration uh, of uh, Paloma. It is an excellent study about the implementation of the plan and we hope that this acceleration uh, means that the money is going to get to the companies and that the companies perceive this. The third disimbursement uh, is going to have more weight, so to say, and not the reforms. So we hope that all the bottlenecks that we have already identified will be solved and uh, for that we need uh, the collaboration of the autonomous and regional administrations about the second one and uh, the, cons the fiscal consolidation and the costs uh, in, and the pensions. The Commission is also linked uh, by the decision of the, cons of the Council that approves uh, this plan. And uh, in this decision there is a calendar, a schedule with some conditionings as uh, the work reform that was approved, finding a uh, balance between flexibility and uh, also about the reforms uh, on the pension plans in the second disembursement and the third one that is going to assist. And uh, also one of the goals of the reforms was to guarantee the adequation of the pensions and this is why we have uh, taken some steps with the indexation and other goals would be to guarantee the sustainability of the system in the long run. And uh, Spain, with uh, these reforms, has uh, proven that uh, the sustainability of the system is mm, fully um, stable and uh, it is our decision that has already been taken. So, Hector, about next generation funds. So, so there are different narratives, so to say. One would be the in the Parliament. Some say that in Spain it's not going to be done. The funds are not well uh, distributed. They are not well spent. And also that uh, 
these uh, criticisms have reached uh, Brussels and an ambassador uh, said that uh, he did not understand uh, how these political parties can do in the can be in the shadow in Brussels, no? And in Spain, we have some difficulties about this because of this Keynesian of the Spanish uh, politics. The other narrative uh, is that the South makes no reforms. If you take a look at the last 10 years, Spain has done three uh, work reforms. Some of them were really hard. As the Minister of Economy said, the last one had a brutal impact. So we've done three work reforms, uh, two pension reforms, two bank reforms. So seven reforms, uh, main reforms. So tell me, Germany has not done a reform since the Hertz reforms back in the 90s by Mr. Schroeder before he uh, left uh, to Gazprom uh, to win money. So why these narratives like this fight between the North and the South and uh, why is this happening in Spain and uh, this gap, so to say, north-south, how would you explain this? It has an important impact on the governance, of course. Well, gracias, Claudia. In the Spanish part, um, I don't want to mention a lot, just uh, as uh, Paloma said, we don't know how well these funds are being spent and uh, but some European commissioners have said that the things are uh, done properly. And uh, in any case, the disembursements of the next uh, generation funds, uh, they are approved by the Commission. And uh, the Council also needs to approve these disembursements. Uh, and it depends on the political will. If there is a political agreement, the money is going to reach, uh, to reach us. Yo el que pregunto en castellà, que soy yo el que fa malament, perdón. Els països del sud d'Europa... So the countries in southern Europe are very interested on these reforms and they have transformed the facility, the next generation EU, in a permanent facility of fiscal policies. And when there will be an economic crisis, this tool is going to be used in order to do the investments in the places or where, where the uh, um, central administration cannot read. So the southern countries need to guarantee that most of the recovery plans that have been presented to the Commission are going to be successful and that we spend the money uh, on time and that the results are positive. So these would be the first way to fight this uh, narrative uh, from the north. And on the other hand, we are very lucky. Uh, there has been a change in the government in Germany. Uh, and it's not the same talking about CDU or Social Democrat, Green and Liberal uh, uh, Party. And uh, so it's the different uh, conversation and we need to underline two things that Germany is already spending without including in their budget so they are going to have a deficit this present year this is what Le Monde uh, said a couple of days ago and also Germany is going to uh, face recession because of the economic model that uh, they have a sponsoring, they have a sponsored in the past, in the last 20 years. And in the South, we had to do some adjustments uh, with uh, some austerity. I uh, think that we need to show solidarity. And here, the South can develop a narrative of solidarity when 
there are problems in the European Union, and this is the way to fight these uh, these narratives, I would say. And Paloma about the Spanish part. Yes, uh, I was so looking forward to this question. No, it's not only about governance; it's more general. So, in the last months. Uh, uh, we've talked um, about the state of law and some parties uh, in the shadow criticizing and uh, saying that uh, Spain is Turkey, when I think the situation is really different. So why do you think this happened? We cannot uh, have a common position and, uh, for example, Merkel had this uh, consolidated position because it was talked in the parliament but um, here it's the other way around in Spain. So what's going on? What's wrong? Because uh, if you see the service, uh, the figures are amazing, the Spanish figures. We've done things, uh, we've uh, followed some proposals and uh, Rahui administration also made some proposals. Also, Sanchez administration has uh, uh, sent some uh, reports, and uh, now with uh, uh, Teresa Rivera as well, with the change of the energy model in Europe. But we get to the European Union or the Commission, and uh, we fight. Uh, so, what's wrong with us? Well, I think that. Uh, it's important to ask this question. We don't ask this question very often, and uh, sometimes we just uh, focus on the anecdote, on the Twitter, but we don't get deeper uh, the way you are doing now. So it's important to ask this question. Spain is not Turkey, that's for sure, and uh, we have some institutions uh, that uh, can improve, and uh, also improving, but uh, we have the a very s solid institution, so we cannot compare Spain with Turkey, and uh, we don't know how to talk, and uh, there is a lack of dialogue, of uh, public policies, a uh, lack of planning at the long run. So when I was uh, studying how to do this uh, planning in the long run with uh, Australia, New Zealand, or Canada, so I felt envy, I felt jealous uh, when I saw their processes that are so institutionalized, these uh, decision-making um, about budgets and uh, in all in, all, in order to measure the impact and also to make decisions uh, that are going to be sustainable in the long run. So these are tools uh, that exist and that we could adopt. But in a country that wants to have this dialogue, and here we are more focused on the short run. So, so there is a problem here in the way we do this recovery plan and this resilience plan, this lack of parliamentary dialogue that you mentioned. And we, time is pressing us because uh, Europe is pressing us to present this plan. It's been was the first country to do so. And, uh, and I was not in the process, but I think it would have been better to take more time to prepare it and uh, also talking about the plan and uh, these investments in the next uh, five years. So also with some reforms that are important. So I think that because of this, this uh, plan, this country plan, because it has to be a plan for the whole country, and uh, the different uh, mechanisms and facilities make that is just a plan for the government. It could have been a plan for the country if it uh, was uh, more ambitious. The process makes this plan 
a government plan and not a country plan. There is a lack of vision. And uh, in my opinion, there is a lack of uh, dialogue and tools that allow us to plan in the long run. And also, I fully agree with what you said, that uh, Europe is very present in our minds uh, as citizens. The next generation is helping uh, to make things tangible. And uh, the conference about the future of Europe uh, is not something that uh, has not been mentioned before, but this is in the media um, every day, and it is present in the minds of the Spanish citizens. So, Spain is a is um, a weird thing, like a widow, so to say, because we are not big, we are not small, and uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, our weight is less than the weight of Poland and, uh, uh, for example, when we are talking about the executives and of the Commission, of the Council, there is a candidacy of the European Parliament that is not going uh, to uh, be elected because there is always a German, a German person or a, a French person that is going to be elected. So why can't we be at the same level? And uh, the Europeanism of uh, Spain, the European values of uh, Spain uh, are very solid and robust. Uh, but uh, they were back in Felipe uh, González Díaz. Uh, uh, Europe was in love with Spain, and Spain was in love with uh, Spain, and Felipe had a very good relationship with Mr. Col and Mr. Mitterrand, but this was lost in the way. So what's wrong? Uh, we Spaniards in Brussels uh, don't uh, have the presence that we should. Well, I don't have an answer for that, but I think that there are a lot of uh, strategies that a country can use in order to make the decisions, and Mr. Ortasson also mentioned uh, uh, that uh, Spain reformed uh, this, uh, well, presented this reform together with the Netherlands, and I think this is the way to go, maybe. And uh, as Paloma said, uh, what we look for with this recovery and resilience uh, facility is uh, to have a country plans. And the terms were very straight, and uh, this meant that the countries had to do things very fast, too fast. So many plans uh, are going to be revisited and reopened in order to use other loans uh, and uh, also using uh, the information and to include a repower a chapter that are going to reduce the dependency on Russian and to improve the energy transition. So we are, the Commission is asking the countries to reinforce uh, their plans before sending the drafts and uh, also this plan has a lot of uh, structural reforms that sometimes are in the shadow. And uh, there are a lot of reforms to improve the, competitive, the competitiveness and also to improve the public uh, Spanish administration. And there is a bill that is, that wants, that is going to be approved uh, with a evaluation, a technical evaluation of all uh, the public policies. And, uh, Sometimes when we have uh, to f talk with the different administrations, they say that this plan is generating a change of the mindset because it's asking for results. And it is something that was not included in the mindset of the administration. So they made a payment and they didn't see, they didn't assess what happened afterwards. Now they have to tell us what's happened because without this report, 
there will be no more disbursements. So, going back to this uh, conference about the future of uh, of Europe, and uh, Europe is the last feasible utopia, as a poet said, and. Uh, in the conference, I read the text, and uh, there are um, very good ideas, but sometimes they are not very uh, practical. Uh, they cannot. They they seem to me that they cannot be implemented. Do you share this opinion? And. Uh, So what needs to happen so that in the conference we have ideas that can be translated into a good governance, that can finish the problems that, uh, that are still there? What needs to happen in Europe? Well, uh, someone could say that there are some experts of think tanks and other institutions in the discussions of the conference of the future of Europe, very controlled with the European uh, administrations. But the goal of the European institutions, the Commission and the Council, not as much the Parliament though, is to reduce the expectations so that uh, the follow up is easy. And also, to say that um, this is included in the priorities of the European Union, so we are not going to revise this. So, the conference about the future of Europe and the economic governance, we need time. And it is a time that was not given. And uh, the organization of the conference uh, could not allow uh, well, did not allow us to give it some food for thought and also the situation of crisis after crisis and after crisis so we had to do a um, conference uh, that lasts uh, two three years whatever needed so that the citizens uh, are fully engaged and also that the institutions truly believe it and adopt these recommendations, recommendations, and there is a solid will uh, to apply them. But uh, there are some governments uh, that said that uh, this is not binding, so this is not obliging us, and uh, because it's not binding, and this is why the result has been what you mentioned. So these. Uh, it's going to tell us that the process is going to be a success and uh, we have very discrete numbers and if uh, these can be replicated in time it's going to be a success also so the problem is that uh, this uh, capability and uh, it's going to be and the way. So it hasn't been a success. No, I don't think so. Because of the participation, reduced participation of the citizens, of course. And uh, last, uh, last question. And then I will open a Q&A session for the audience. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. So let's imagine that Spain does things correctly. Is yes, it for me? Yes. So that we spend the money and we do the reforms and uh, this is the change of the structure that is told and uh, the other scenario is to do things bad. So the other scenario is to do the things right and the other thing is to do things wrong. What would happen in the second case, in the second scenario? So let's imagine that we th do things good right. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, plan, but uh, I think we can do it reasonably uh, well. The structural changes need way more time, but it's uh, 
allowing us to push some reforms that would have uh, taken longer to, to implement. And I see it in the companies. And uh, I am very, I am in, in the entrepreneur uh, world, and I can see that they are accompanying the next generation funds with investments that are public private, with uh, funds from the European Union, and also with uh, private funds. And uh, there would not be a project. So the companies have a fundamental role and uh, what I see is uh, an acceleration of uh, plants, for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to give a boost to this plan. And uh, it is in the reality of the CAPEX investment of companies nowadays and uh, also, with the potential of Spain as a producer of hydrogen from southern Europe, I think it's going to have a positive impact. It's going to accelerate the energy efficiency. It is going to be fundamental in order to tackle the energy this new energy model, the storage capabilities. Also, it's going to be to boost the essential components with the microchips. It's going to boost uh, the electric mobility, the connected mobility, the sustainability. And uh, I think that the great advantage is uh, the public investing, investment and this recommendation of uh, this uh, mobilization of uh, private funds and the innovation and the transformation because the public funds uh, motivate the private funds too. And uh, also, I'm not an expert on, on economic Uh, of economic uh, conditions, but I am an expert in governance. Uh, so Europe has uh, bet for these plans uh, with uh, this common goal. So if we fail in the implementation of these plans, we're going to lose the credibility of this tool that it's essential for the European Union. So the European Union going back to the market, issuing debt and funding a strategic uh, project, the same as the states do when they do these plans of fiscal stimulus that we can do it at European level is fundamental and in order to do that we need to do things right and also we need some institutional trust of course. So I'm not going to ask you what's going to happen if we do things wrong but I'm going to ask you last last question about the patches and uh, and uh, the economic governance. In the Stability Pact, we have seen a lot of patches, uh, Moscovici and suspension, and it seems that we are just improvising. And I also see some patches here in the repowerment, and uh, for example, including gas and nuclear as a green energy and also the money from the next generation that uh, are going to be spent uh, because uh, and now we have incentives to ask uh, for this. So this 200,000 million is going to be 100,000 one, 100, or zero. So I remember back uh, the Juncker plan uh, mobilizing billions and it was a complete disaster. I should be the, mo the moderator and be moderate, uh, but sorry for the words. But the, junk the Juncker plan didn't work. And uh, now we see the same patches, so to say. I don't know if you share this opinion 
So the first one about patches and economic covenants, I think that it is very logical that when we revise a political uh, policy, we see what happened in the past and see if we can adapt what we did in the past to the future. So integrating patches, uh, I think that uh, it's just the result of an assessment. and. Uh, it's done in order to uh, reach an improvement, the patches of repower. Uh, well, in the repower plan and uh, the uh, modification of the resilience plan of the Commission, we can see that the additional funding that is added to this uh, facility is done through the stability facility of the emissions regime, 20,000 million additional, and also the voluntarily transfers that the members can do, up to 12.5 of, of all the money they have into the resilience plan. And this has some advantages. They don't have to add national funding in order to reach the goals. So there is the need to do this additional investment and from this resilience plan. And you might feel that these loans that were at the disposal of the countries and they were asked if they were going to use them, taking into account the new goals. And I don't know if I'm answering your question here. Well, yes, I'm going to open up a Q&A session. You are not, please don't be shy. Please introduce yourself. And please ask the question, tell us uh, what your question is for. My name is Marti, and I don't know uh, to whom, so whoever. So before the Next Generation Plan was uh, uh, issued, Spain, during the pandemic, uh, uh, said that they wanted to industrialize their companies and put in and boost the companies and uh, not depending only on the tourism. This is what we were thinking during the pandemic. So my question is, to what extent for Spain, what's the weight of the investment in order to boost uh, the Spanish industry in this next generation? So this, uh, this promise uh, of being better after the pandemic. So is it included in the administration plans? Uh, so we didn't mention you, but he was looking at you. So maybe it's you, the one who should answer. Well, thank you very much, Marty. I cannot give you a figure because we don't uh, label that, but I can tell you that in the Spanish plan, there is a component uh, talking about reforms, about the industrial governance, and also circular economy, and also waste management, and uh, investments. And one of the most uh, relevant investments are uh, the uh, strategic uh, projects uh, that want to transform the value chain in different territories of the country, and also modernizing and transforming the Spanish industry with a um, budget of 30 30,000 30, million euros. So this is going to be a boost for the industrial reform. Yeah, well, nothing to add. I was going to talk about uh, these uh, territorial plans as well, this territorial uh, project, and uh, it is one of the main innovations. And they all have an industrial component and they are doing, uh, they are executing it uh, very correctly and they are moving forward 
in the organization of this, uh, PERDES, uh, these uh, projects, uh, for example, in the autonomous vehicle. We need innovation. We need uh, to talk about the value chain. And uh, in these uh, projects, uh, we need to have uh, groups of companies in the tenders, so together with SMEs in the value chain, and also uh, training and innov innovation is included in the tenders, so that uh, these projects uh, can update and modernize and generate new industry. For example, in affordable take uh, cells done here in Spain. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have uh, two questions uh, from Tatiana, one from for Maria Canal. These retroactive uh, reforms means that are uh, going to have a negative impact uh, on education and healthcare or not? And Paloma, the next generation investment on hydrogen will mean another recolonization of Africa. Well, the second one, can you repeat it? Yes, if the next generation investment in hydrogen will mean a recolonization of Africa, recolonization of Africa, oh gosh. Well, the first question. Uh, the retroactive reforms in the recovery plan, some of them are focused on the digitalization of SMEs and acquiring digital skills. And um, also, the European Commission and the European Council for the first payment was very positive. So I think they have totally contributed to the goals of the plan. So I don't know if there are any aspects uh, in these reforms that make you feel uncomfortable. So that's my question, that I think that they really contributed to the goals of uh, Spain, of having a more digital, resilient and inclusive Spain about hydrogen. No comments. I think that uh, the Hydrogen can make us look at different regions, and I don't think, uh, well, I'm, I don't know if it is colonization, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if Paloma wants to say something, but uh, we can also find a balance uh, uh, when we do transactions with third uh, countries. Uh, about the first one, I think that there is an identification of some reforms with adjustments. Uh, this is what happened also 10 years ago. And uh, fortunately, uh, the point of view of the Commission was not the same of uh, the Commission. So the point of view has changed uh, because Europe has seen uh, that the Europeans were lost in the way. What do you say? Yes, it is true. And. Uh, <laughs> What uh, we have done in the next generation EU is uh, what should be done in the reforms of the fiscal uh, framework. So if there are some countries that do not fulfill these standards, uh, then the adjustment plans uh, have to, to be, together with the reforms, have to be done ad hoc, and they have to be in a dialogue with the Commission and the Council to adapt it to the um, specific situations and uh, obviously it is a lesson that we have learned uh, from the crisis uh, of the past. So Paloma, do you want to say um, anything else? Well, the second uh, question, we could open up a, another round table about it. A, if we are concerned about Africa, we have to look at China because it is China that is doing a questionable thing there, exploiting the natural resources and, uh, in Africa. About hydrogen in the next generation, the investments that are done have to be done in, in the country. So we are going to invest on the country. We are going to generate hydrogen in Spain. We are going to commercialize hydrogen in Spain towards Europe. And uh, with uh, 
we should be able to protect uh, these interests, but the investment and the production is done here on the field. Yes, I'd like to add something. But in the plans, there are also investments that are going to reinforce the healthcare system. For example, we are purchasing high uh, technology equipment uh, with thousands of, of millions uh, being used to renew the equipment in all the country, also investment in um, education. So we need to take into account the social component, also investing on people. This is also included in the resilience plan. And uh, it is another lesson that we have learned uh, from the crisis, one of the demands uh, in this uh, uh, conference is that we need to analyze the social costs of these adjustments and of uh, these investments. Uh, yeah, the social pillar that we haven't uh, seen in Brussels. Uh, any other questions? My name is uh, Claudia. I'm going to ask the question in Catalan about uh, something very important for young people, pensions and sustainability of pensions. And as uh, Paloma said, I would like to ask if on this model of sustainability, you take into account this neoliberal model and the erosion it can cause in our welfare state. And also in, from Brussels, you think it's a good option or not? and which are the forecasts about these problems and here in Spain it is a product of the pension plans from 10,000, 8,000, now 1,500 and they are boosting these uh, pension plans of companies towards uh, physical people. And so what's your opinion in Europe regarding this and uh, what's going to be implemented? So, Paloma, I think it's a question for Jose Luis Escriva, but uh, give us your opinion, please. I understood most of it and I don't have uh, questions because I'm not an ex I don't have a, I don't have an answer because I'm not an expert but I can tell you that the Commission is not going to be in the reform it's going to assess if these models are sustainable in our expenditure capability and if it's going to be sustainable uh, the pensions in in the future and I don't know if it's going to be indexed or not the model is something that the state needs to think of and they need to justify the sustainability of this of this model the Spanish government was not very capable of conveying these uh, ideas social ideas like for example the minimum uh, rent and uh, so it's been difficult for the government to translate all this like the minimum income and the minister Escriva has a uh, job to do he has to explain what uh, this intergenerational uh, mechanism or facility that is very important for our pensions and uh, the Commission has liked it but there are a lot of people the public opinion he feels very negative about it maybe because it's uh, not been well explained and also because the pension reform is still going to to happen. 
the most important part of it, about this facility and the components. The Commission is going to talk about this in the fourth disimbursement. Now, the Commission has said that they are concerned about something because we need to guarantee the sustainability of the system. And right now, with the data uh, that we have, uh, we, ha we, we have doubts. So when we ask uh, Minister Escrivaje says that it is normal that the Commission says that because the mechanism is not, uh, the facility is not uh, well determined. So you cannot uh, give, we cannot give you a figure. So it is going to be one of the main discussions. Like, uh, for example, if the pensions are going to be increased uh, depending on the inflation, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for the government. And uh, so maybe we're going to be told off by Brussels if uh, we match it uh, with the inflation. So it's not going to be easy. Two more questions. Well, first of all, good afternoon. I'm Pablo about um, the next generation funds and the startups. Uh, the Economist uh, said and underlined that the ratio of innovation in Europe and creation of unicorns is lower than other countries like in the United States, Australia and Canada. And uh, in Europe and in Spain, people go to states or Australia in order to develop their startups. So why is this happening? A union of 400 million inhabitants with an industrial tradition since the Industrial Revolution. We have this problem. And uh, if uh, the next generation funds and uh, the European Union are going to solve this problem, improve our situation, based based innovation, because it's one of the axes of the future, and we have an advantage vis a vis our competitors. It is one of the improvements of the competitiveness that we are trying to achieve. There is a component about SMEs, and the Commission has identified that startups have a problem to grow in this space. Well, multiple causes, uh, our culture of entrepreneurship, how a failure is perceived, uh, and lack of funding during the first stages, venture capital, and uh, there is a draft uh, that uh, I don't remember the name, but it's a draft about the startups in which uh, they want to facilitate all this with a better funding and also appealing foreigners uh, who want uh, to do this in Spain uh, through a passport uh, for entrepreneurs. And uh, with this uh, fund that is created in these reforms, and that the next tech f mm, uh, form, we have also a project that wants to improve the situation of this second oppor of, ha of having a second opportunity, the second opportunity law. That's very important for entrepreneurs here in Spain. Paloma. No, th nothing to add. There was another question. I just wanted to say that since uh, you invited me to talk, and uh, this uh, idea that can be solved uh, and that is related to different models and uh, What success in life, and what's a professional career? Maybe it's more in the Anglo-Saxon culture and not in the Spanish culture. Maybe from the education perspective, we should insist on this. Yeah, that the bottom-up and uh, the other way around. So about the conditionality. Yeah. My name is Victor, by the way. The conditionality of the generation, next generation funds, and knowing the inflation and the recession in many countries. So, how do you think how the Commission is going to face this uh, change in the economy? 
right? And uh, we have uh, other problems that we had solved, like inflation. So how is uh, the conditionality of these funds changing and also the deployment of the next uh, uh, stages of next generation EU? Good, very good question. Well, uh, the regulation of this facility obliges the Commission to check the cost of the investment, to double check if it was reasonable when approving the plan. This cost uh, did not take into account the inflation nowadays. So the Commission, uh, what the Commission has done is to specify in which cases a member state can say that it is impossible to fulfill the term because of uh, an increase in the cost of energy or disruptions in the uh, supply chain. There are some investments that can be really impacted. Uh, so they will have to justify it and revise the terms maybe for these investments. Yes, Christina, another question for Hector. Recently, the next generation uh, was called a Hamiltonian moment for you, but as Claudia said, what happens if it's, it goes wrong or if there are uh, differences between the different countries? Well, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, the next generation fund uh, creation was uh, compared to the Hamiltonian moment in the States and the that uh, was paid uh, in a common way. But um, yesterday I was uh, listening to Javier Solana and he said that all the steps that were taken since the pandemic and uh, have moved towards a more federal Europe and uh, there's still a long way to go. And uh, If the plants uh, and the states uh, don't uh, sell and don't do the reforms that they are supposed to do following the plan, this fund is going to last a uh, definite time. But if the goal is to reach this uh, federal Europe, this utopia, the investments have to be done right. So it's going to be a permanent uh, facility and uh, it's going to be another step towards this Hamiltonian uh, idea. And uh, we should be more humble. There is time for one last question, just one last question. Well, good afternoon. My name is Diana, and we've been talking about the industry in Spain, investing in our industry with these new funds. But what's the efficiency of investing if we take into account that nowadays SMEs and companies have uh, a lot of costs in energy and uh, fuel. So Claudio Ranzadi said that the best industrial policy is the one that does not exist, but we don't agree, right? No, because if we agreed, uh, we would be out of term. And uh, I think that uh, your question is very relevant. You are asking for the short run vis-a-vis -vis the long run. The government is implementing some mechanisms as uh, during COVID and after 2008, but also the need to overcome this uh, crisis and planning and positioning yourself for the future. And uh, 
here we have the next generation funds with loans uh, that are going to be very appealing because zero cost for investment projects uh, for the SMEs uh, and uh, the percentage of uh, loan is higher than for the big companies so obviously they will have to use their own money but the ones that will be able to do it through loans uh, or their own private funds uh, they are going to take advantage of this opportunity because it's starting this uh, long way taking into account the difficulties of the context that we are living presently and we are having some complementary measures and there will be many more to come yes and uh, there are some measures so that the countries can give support to the companies uh, and uh, through this uh, flexibility of uh, this uh, regulation so this facility is going to help them to tackle these costs and invest uh, so yes it's an advantage uh, we need to take so as uh, Woody Allen said the best economist uh, in the world uh, economic problems are very easy to solve money and uh, we did many more things so thank you very much to you all very good questions let me congratulate you for the questions thank you Paloma because it's difficult to do things online thank you for your participation and uh, Paloma, Hector, Maria, you've uh, been at a very high level. Tomorrow there will be more. Thank you.